Good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to echo, this is Ed Sniffen. He's with the mayor's office and works with me. Um, we just went through a very difficult day. I see some very familiar faces here from the council meeting today, uh, where we, the council did pass out the sit live uh, law that allows us to enforce uh, sidewalk clearances. And uh, it was very um, emotional. Um, but I am so delighted to see all of you here. Uh, it shows us one thing, one very, very important thing, and that all of you, all of you care about solving the homelessness issue. And, um, and the fact that you took the time out from your very busy schedules to be here means that from our standpoint, the city is at least on track in trying to address this very complex and difficult problem. The reason we organized this meeting was because, as all of you know, we are attempting to establish the Housing First Transition Center on Sand Island. This will be the first initiative of this sort ever. I spent a lot of time reading about homeless encampments over the last few days. And there are a lot of studies done, and some of them were really remarkable stories of successful homeless encampments. But all of them, every single one of them that I read about in the study, there's probably about 25 in the study, the two or three studies that I read, all of them were started by the homeless themselves, and they grew organically. And they, some of them have lives of maybe 15 years because they started in 2000. And others have grown up over the years. And they all started for the same reason. And that's, there wasn't enough shelter. There wasn't enough permanent shelter. And most of them were all uh, based on the tough economic times that everyone was suffering starting in the 20s and the 20, 2000s. But this is a... What makes this plan remarkable is that it's, it's the only plan that has ever been attempted by a municipality. Every single other study that I read of a homeless encampment was started by the homeless. And so we hope that the stakeholders and people who live in San Island, live and work in San Island, will join our support of this effort because you are truly at the beginning of something that is relatively remarkable but I want to temper those, temper that because it is not, repeat, not the solution. This transition center is intended for one very specific purpose, and that is to be the bridge between people on the streets and those who will get into permanent supportive housing through the city's Housing First efforts that we are trying to get moving as the city council gave us the money to do this and both our program as well as the state's Housing First program is moving off the ground, but it's, it's a little slow doing all the, the groundwork to it. And this project evolved for only that reason, and that's to put a bridge between people moving from the street and into Housing First, into permanent supportive housing. So I hope that all of you stakeholders and residents of, uh, who live and work in the San Island area Keep an open mind. We ask for your support because it's important that we all work as a community together to solve homelessness. And for those of you in the homeless community who have brought your ideas, we welcome those ideas and we, because we want to make this work. Um, and so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. At this time, I'll call up um, Director Pam Woody Open, um, Director of our. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Deputy Director Yu Yurai for our Emergency Management Science so going to start off the presentation, and Director Woody Open will, will assist as well. Good evening, my name is Peter. I work for the Department of Emergency Management. We used to be civil defense, for those of you not familiar with the moniker. Uh, you may be asking why civil defense is involved in this because of. If we have a hurricane, we have to do the transitional, post-hurricane transitional housing. So it was a logical fit that the managing director in the roles on emergency management for this. 
I turned off the lights so you could see the map better. I apologize if your cameras have poor quality, but hopefully you can see the slides a little better okay. with the lights off. You're from the city or the state? Yes. I'm from the city. City and County Honolulu. My apologies. The City Department of Emergency Management. Thank you for clarifying that. So this is where the location is going to be. Uh, Managing Director Shin talked about bridging the gap. Well, this is the literal bridge, not the figurative bridge here. So we're going to cross over the bridge. And as soon as you cross the bridge, if you're familiar with this area, there is the Marine Training Center. If you keep going straight down, there's a right-hand turnoff. And for those of you from the BMX track, you know about this track. And eventually this road ends up to the Marine Training Center and the boat launch area. So this yellow, the yellow trapezoid is the area that we're addressing tonight. So again, this is the purpose of the center, to provide transitional site into the Housing First program, to provide a safe, stable, and supportive environment. This will allow them to have assessment, supportive services, and referrals to appropriate programs. It will be a transition to the permanent housing under the Housing First program. And very important is 24-7 on-site security and facility management. Some of the layout that you'll see, and there's a map board in the back if you want to peruse that later on at your convenience. Part of the temp temporary infrastructure will be office trailers for the service provider to work out of, portable toilets and showers, a secure storage area for personal belongings, shaded areas protected from the elements, we're talking the sun mostly, as many of you know it's very hot out there, recreational areas, and we're going to have water, electricity, and lighting going into the, going into the facility. These are some of the criteria for participation, and what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Director Woody Oakland from the Department of Community Services. Thank you, Peter. My name is Pam Woody Oakland from Community Services. Um, like the Managing Director said, it's nice to see many familiar faces. Thank you all for your compassion on addressing our homeless um, challenges for our community. And I'm going to ask the question first, does everybody know what Housing First is? Yes. Raise your hand if you don't. Okay, for those who have raised their hand, it's a philosophy. And it's a philosophy of changing from an old model that was a clean and sober requirement before you could move into a shelter, and a shelter that moved you through a transitional setting to a more permanent setting. Housing First is to get you housed in a permanent setting first and foremost and then work on your life skills or health problems or other social services get wrapped around you to help you stay stable in that home setting. Okay, so that's, it's more of a philosophy. You, we all use the word um, to mean some different things. For providers, Housing First is a program. There's funding that goes with that, and if that pro funding provides housing and wraparound services. And then there's this Housing First Transi Transition Center. Um, not to be confused with the Housing First program that's going to provide the permanent setting and the wraparound services. So we're going to talk about the criteria for moving into this transition center, and it's purely voluntary. And so when we receive the comments and the concerns about going out and using the new ordinances for enforcement, it was where are you going to put folks? Where, where can folks go? What alternatives do they have? And there are shelter spaces. On any given day, there's more than 100 shelter beds available, but folks ask for another option, so this is another option. So it's purely voluntary. When we do our enforcements, we're going to have a bus that can transport anyone who chooses to, to, to take themselves on the bus and come to Sand Island, as opposed to just moving along and, and losing their belongings. The two criteria that will prohibit folks from coming in here would be, one, if you've been convicted of a violent crime within the last two years, or if you're an undocumented resident. And these two criteria are very consistent with most federal housing funding programs. Section 8 rules are the same and shelter plus care rules. And there are minor variations of, but these are consistent with those programs. And because we intend to use those programs as the long-term sustainable funding, we wanted to establish the same criteria now. And the focus is going to be on the most vulnerable uh, homeless individuals and families. Um, managing Director spoke about a vulnerability index, and that's a tool 
that all of the providers who serve the homeless individuals and families have collaborated on that evaluates the conditions of these individuals, whether it's their mental state, their physical state, how long they've been on the, the um, homeless or houseless, as some prefer to say, um, what's their employability, what is their mental capacity, and each one of these, and I'm not the expert on this, but each one of these factors has a criteria. It's a scale of one to 20. If you're scoring 10 to 20, you're a candidate for housing first, permanent supportive housing. If you're below that 10, you're either eligible for some sort of other rental assistance, they refer to as rapid rehousing, or a shelter setting. So we're gonna use that index to determine who goes into the housing first, permanent supportive housing. And we're also going to use that same criteria. You must come in here and be assessed. And we're going to use that cri same criteria and determine whether you're eligible for the housing first or whether we're going to help refer you to another more appropriate setting. And I believe I'm getting into, OK, that was it, yeah. So that's how you get into, that's what the criteria is to getting into the transitional <coughs> center. Basic house rules are going to be privacy, respect the privacy, property, and safety of others. Okay, so those are going to be the most basic house rules that we're all going to operate under. So as I mentioned, the assessment tool is, Holly Malama is the program that has developed this vulnerability index, so everyone coming in must be assessed. That is a, a, a given. Then we'll do the appropriate referral to the housing, health care, or treatment program. And we'll work, we will have, as Managing Director mentioned, 24-hour security and 24-hour staff from the service provider network on property. And so once you come in, you'll come in and get assessed. You'll be able to shower, we'll have hygiene centers, we'll have uh, bathroom showers, storage facilities, a place to bring your own tent and, and stay. We will be separating the different populations, the men from the women and families. Um, but the case management will be an ongoing effort to determine what your best, what is the most appropriate housing setting for you, and we will help you get into that setting as soon as possible. This is not a shelter. It's not meant to be long term. We're hoping that we're going to be able to assess folks and move them out within months. It's not going to be a long term commitment. In order to accommodate those who may be there waiting for that permanent housing first we will be providing transportation. So there's, a, I believe, a middle street, there's a hub. So there's a bus hub relatively close to the location. So we'll be providing shuttles back and forth from the site to the transportation hub to allow folks to have access to get around town. We will be providing, the city will be providing trust services as well as the hygiene centers that we talked about. And we're continuing um, to outreach with the service providers and other community members for other basic needs. Hy hy hygiene products, uh, food is something we haven't pinned down yet, but it may be a possibility. We've been talking to churches. In fact, community groups have reached out to us to how can they partner with us on this effort. So that's the, the basics of how it's going to operate. At this time, I'll turn it back to Peter to give you some more specifics about the timing, and we'll go into questions and answers after that. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. So, come on, give her a hand. So you may be asking about the anticipated timing of this center. First step is to go to the Friday's meeting of the Board and Board of Land and Natural Resources, State of Hawaii, Department of Land and Natural Resources. The board grants us a right of entry and we continue our due diligence with the process, with the lease, with all the paperwork, the right of entry. Then we reach out to the homeless communities and service providers for input. And we should begin operation within two or three months. Down the road, we would operate the site at capacity for one year while we acquire the units to move people into permanent housing. And then we can reassess at the end of that one year and the site would transition out of operation. We, we do not anticipate being there any longer than two years. That's all I have, and at this point, what we're going to do is I'm going to turn it back over to Ed Sniffin from the mayor's office, and he's going to facilitate the question, the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Director. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> so that's the presentation, the informational presentation that we had presented or prepared for you. Um, it's a pretty full room, and I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to come up and give their comments and input on this. Um, that being said, I would love for you guys to try and limit your, your comments to about a minute uh, to make sure everybody has the opportunity to come up. Um, we're going to have our, Lynn will be here holding the microphone, and you can come up and uh, up here um, and use the microphone so everybody can, can listen in. Is there anybody who would like to come up and comment? Can you answer some questions first? Please, please. Like, what is a documented citizen? It's someone who has to be in our country legally. So you have to have, and I'm not the immigration expert, but you have to have either be a citizen or have legal legally residing in the um, state of Hawaii. I'm sorry. Do you think it will? Do you think okay, green card. Do you think it will cause a landslide of people coming over from the mainland when they hear there's free housing in Hawaii and maybe increase the homeless population significantly? No, we do not anticipate that. We do know that there is a small percentage of our homeless population that are from the mainland. I think we just saw a series of articles in the paper that talked about that as well. But we do not anticipate that to occur. There's another reason why we don't anticipate that will occur here at our transition center, and that's because the center is to provide our, the service for the most vulnerable and chronic homeless, not transi transigence, tra trans transient, transient, thank you, not transient folks who have come to Hawaii and fallen on hard times. Chronically homeless is a defined term, and I'm going to let Pam tell you exactly what it is. And those transients from the mainland will not qualify to stay at our transition center. That's a definition I should have given you earlier. Our, our Housing First program is targeting the chronically homeless. And by definition, you must be disabled and homeless at least a year or more or four times within the last three years. So it's not likely that that population would be someone new to the state. Are you going to uh, uh, to include the Micronesians and the people from the Pacific Ocean, uh, South no. Pacific Ocean? The criteria will be applied the same. Yeah, let, let us ask you folks to please come up and ask the questions at the mic for the benefit of the entire audience, and we'll be happy to ask them. So maybe you want to line up on this side so that you can have your turn at the microphone. For those who are microphone shy, if you want to write down your question and pass it up, we can accommodate that as well. I'm Marcia Joyner of the Chamber of Commerce for Persons with Disabilities. And of course, my question is about people with disabilities. And so many of them are chronically homeless. Uh, so what provisions have you for them? in terms of wheelchairs, walkers, and other such things. Uh, also, what about families with children? And you mentioned getting the people to the bus stop at Middle Street. Well, who's going to pay the $60 a month for the bus pass? So those are my questions. Some of those questions are ahead of us in terms of process. We just published a request for qualifications for provider, and all the details of the day-to-day -day operations of that provider's programs is a work in progress, and I think we identified that. We're going to sit with the providers. Transportation is something that many programs buy bus passes to accommodate that need. Um, we are welcoming families with children. They will be separated from the single adult population. And, and wheelchairs, walkers, people with real disabilities. I'm not Physical familiar. and mental disabilities, what about them? Are they welcome? How do you handle that? And where do they go? I just want to make sure that you understand. I know that you're advocating for the homeless population, and that's fabulous, okay? This is not the answer to all the homeless population's needs. This is a program that is a transitional center in order for us to segue into the city's Housing First program and permanent housing. But there are some people with disabilities that are chronic that have been on the street for a very long time. For, so for, for them to go to these places is what I'm asking. 
uh, well, facilities for them when well, they get here? The only That's answer my question. I can give you is that it's flat. Uh -huh. And so there is right now no barriers for like a wheelchair or people in walkers or who have physical disabilities. So it is flat. But if you're asking us whether that we are specifically targeting to accommodate those with physical disabilities, the answer is that we are targeting the most vulnerable chronic homeless on the streets. Does that answer your question? Thank you. I don't have so much a question but a comment. I've actually been out to this site twice. Um, not only is it very dry, it's extremely hot. Um, there's no concrete, it's actually dust, this fine, silty dust that wafts into the air at the slightest draft of wind. And it gets pretty windy. It's surrounded by kiabi bushes that have thorns that are this big, about one to two inches in length, spaced on each branch about two to three inches apart from each other. So if you cut down all of these bushes, say that that's the next step, you have no shade, right? Even if you erect a canopy, there will be no shade outside of that canopy. On top of the fact that this place is isolated. Now, the concern with the community might be of your own safety. As an advocate, the concern for me is for the safety of these extreme poor. Not all of them are violent. In fact, the vast majority are very peaceful and just struggling. They suffer from a host of uh, mental illnesses but there's only 25% that actually suffer from mental illness. The vast majority are just struggling to get by. This plan is not Pono. On top of that, there are some serious concerns about the toxicity in this area, that the city has not done its due diligence to research, and are so quick to relegate the extreme poor after criminalizing them that you were successful in doing, as an excuse to say, now we have somewhere to put them. Well, that's internment. And you cannot, please, I beg you, as a local person, my family has been here four generations. I grew up in privilege. Thankfully, my grandparents and my parents taught me with the difference between right and wrong, and I'm asking you, my fellow local citizens, do not support this plan. It is the furthest thing from Pono, and this City Council, City Group, has not done its homework. I have seen plans put together by ninth graders that are better, better than this. And the managing director herself said it's the only proposal that's actually been developed by the city. Why has all of the other plans for homeless encampments worked? Because, she said herself, they've been put together by homeless people, not the city that mandated them to go here. Thank you, Catherine. We are aware and acknowledge the condition of the site. It is hot, it is flat, it is dusty, and it does have the cabbie thorns. And those are all conditions that we are prepared to address in terms of cutting back the brush, in terms of ridding it of our departments of Park and Recreation has been helping us to address, uh, develop a solution that will address the thorns for the safety of the resident, the folks, the individuals and families who are living there. Um, we will be laying down asphalt as a foundation to address the um, dust issues, and we've also um, investigated the cost of fans, the types that have misting in them, to address the temperature again. So, in terms of trying to provide a safe environment that is comfortable, it's not going to be, what's the right word for it? It's, it's going to be comfortable. It's going to be very basic. That's the word I was trying. It's just going to be basic. We're going to address the dust, the heat, as well as the threat of the thorns and the, the brush. My grandfather was interned at the Sand Island facility, one of the very few during World War II. And uh, so I am quite offended by that description. This is not an internment camp. 
This is an attempt to create a bridge facility. If in fact, people who are homeless want to avail themselves of this service, it is available for them. It is not mandated. We're not requiring anyone to be here, but we actually think this is a good idea to have this transition. And that's the whole purpose of putting this program together. Um, we hope that it's going to be embraced by the homeless community or those who want to go into permanent housing because that's the whole purpose as a transition into permanent housing. So I would like um, Ed Sniffen to address some of the land issues because he's been dealing with the Department of Health. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this site, because it was close to a municipal ash and landfill area, we, looked, we spoke to the um, Department of Health, especially their um, here side, to make sure we understood all of the potential hazards on the site. When we looked at the, the reports that they had, um, there were several letters that came out. One was a, an action, uh, an action a letter for um, indicating to harbors of um, no, no additional action necessary for their project. And in that letter, they had indicated that for a harbor, for a container yard, there was no additional um, action necessary from them. They could go forward with the project as it was. Um, however, they did state in the letter that any other usage that would be more sensitive would require additional action. So I spoke with um, Supervisor Phoenix Grange there to make sure we understood what that meant. And from her perspective, our plan to cover the site with recycled asphalt pavement would cut off the path of whatever contaminants were, were out there. Now this is just her perspective at this time. She totally understood, she, she indicated, we totally understand that we have additional due diligence to do on site to make sure it be safe. And we understand that. And I'd like you to understand that this is a very, very early time in this initiative right now. Um, right now, we don't even know if we can get the land from the other lot. We're trying to make sure that happens on Friday. If it does, then we're going to keep moving forward with all of our due diligence. Site due diligence, um, program due diligence, facility due diligence. All those things need to be worked on going forward. So it kind of, this is kind of where we are on this, on this site at this time. Please. Hi, um, I'm Erica LaCroix, the Chancellor of Honolulu Community College and Marine and Training Center there at ours. Um, my question is a logistical question that has to do with um, electricity and water and what are the at least preliminary plans to get that to that site? Thank you for the question. Border water supply has a line that goes underneath Sand Island Parkway from the Manson side and comes up between your property and the vacant lot right between the sidewalk and the fence line. And we're gonna take a pipe from there and go along the fence line into the property, the opposite direction. So we're not gonna tap any of the water coming into the Marine Training Center. For the electricity, we're meeting with HECO, and we, we, to tell you the honest truth, we don't know yet. We're gonna meet with them and determine how best to get electricity into the facility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking that into consideration. I've been dealing with homeless people for over 50 years, and they used to be in Sand Island until they said, you know, we have to get this homeless all out of here, yeah? And then what they say, called Magic Island, remember that? I don't believe you guys remember that. And then all the homeless went to our Ala Park. They from Ala Park, they were thrown out, so they went to Chinatown. All downtown area, now they're in Waikiki. Now, finally, the city opened their eyes. Thank God you are taking them back to Sand Island. Sand Island is beautiful. I don't know why they say it's not. It's nice when you put to sleep. It's good. It's also near the highway where they can, if they want to go holo holo, they still can go. But it's a very safe place. And I'll be doing, again, my 28th year of KK Christmas. Thank you for that consideration. Thank you for your comments. Hello, Christopher Nova Smith, Deontay Pai, Honolulu. Uh, I had one question. From what I understood from the city, that this is supposed to help 100 people for the Housing First project, uh, initiative, correct? So if we're only helping 100 people and we're taking the funds from Housing First for something that's temporary that still has no guarantee if we're even able to start this, how are we going to put that money back into Housing First to make sure that that initiative is able to keep going? The funds that we're using are going to 
run the transition center, operate the center, and refer to the housing first. Yes, we have used a small portion of that total $3 million appropriation, and we're committed to asking for another $3 million in the next year's budget. So there will be still sufficient funds to support the 100 individuals in permanent supportive housing. Okay, so for 100, 100 people, you're suggesting it's going to cost a total of $6 million? No, I'm saying for the first year, it's 25000 The average cost is about 25000 per person for an entire year. Okay. And we're going to be starting this project, the program, in November. So we're, we're nine months into this fiscal year. And then next year would be an additional, because you need to continue to support the same individuals for another year. So it would be an additional $3 million next year. But it's $12,000 on average for a person to live in an apartment. Correct. So this, us taxpayers are paying twice the amount to deplete our community resources even further to do something that's much easier, you know, in the, in the short and long term. Is it Christopher? Right? Yes. Okay, Christopher. It's 25000 of which per person per year, 12000 pays for the rent, the 13000 pays for the case management, and the supportive services. It does that assessment, it determines whether these um, individuals need mental health support, substance abuse support, other life skills training, and all of that is wrapped up into that same 25,000, the housing and the supportive services. Now, as that process goes on, and we work with these individuals, many of them are going to be disabled or have mental health conditions that are gonna enable them to use other benefits. So they may be eligible for disability insurance or Medicaid and other health care benefits that are going to take the cost of that $13,000 for wraparound services and reduce it down to a lesser amount in a future year. Okay, okay so that $25,000 per person. Give me okay, well, that, okay, well, okay, so it's $13,000 more on top of what taxpayers are already paying for, correct? Right? Because these services are already here. The problem that I see with the, the way everything's ran within the government, it's in several different buildings. And like uh, for EBT, for instance, right? They only help 12 people a day. And if somebody drops something off in the box and you stand in line, you may not, even if you are one of those 12 people, may not even get help. So you've got people standing in line for months waiting to get that service because people are cutting in front of the line or doing whatever because only 12 people are helped. What I'm getting at is we're, it's, it seems like uh, we're wasting more funds for 1% of the chronic home, uh, or actually 10% of the chronic home, homeless and 1% of the actual homeless that's on the island. Because we have 9,500 people that's question. homeless. And, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Director Woody Oakland to wrap this up. If you want to discuss further, we can discuss after the meeting outside. But I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to comment. Well, I don't think I'm asking hard questions. So well, I think they're I'm, easy I'm gonna questions. Ask, I'm going to ask her to answer the question. Know. I'm going to ask her to ask, answer the question to wrap it up so we can move on to the next one. Okay. What the reason we're funding Housing First. It is a national best practice. It's evidence-based. The, the method you talk about where it's piecemeal and in different agencies has not proven to be successful. And that is the very reason we are wrapping around into one contract, one provider is going to be doing both the housing and the services because that is nationally been proven to work better. Right. So that answers but your question. But for 100 people and not the 9,500 that's on the island. Christopher, we okay. are the city and we have what funding we have, and we appreciate that I support. I hear you have $40 million that's been allotted to it, and so far you want $6 million to help 100 people. We can talk about that later on if you'd like to. Okay, actually that's not for services. If I could finish that, that $44,000 is in our capital improvement budget. Million. For a million. Thank you. <laughs> it is for brick and mortar. It is for acquisition or rehab capital. or renovation of housing. It is not to support services at all. That's in our capital budget. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just want to ask prior to speaking if I'm not uh, being recorded. I don't want to be on the news for one thing. Okay. You're, you're or in the newspaper. The, this is going live to the internet. I'll keep it face this way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So with that being said, I would like to have by a show of hands, how many of you actually live in this community? As, just as I thought, not very many people, okay? So where I'm going with this is that a lot of the people involved in creating this plan do not live here. I live here, okay? And I'm gonna be affected by all of this that's coming down the pipes. And being 
just this one voice, I don't know if I have a very big impact tonight. The only two people I have faith in right now, in city government or in the state for that um, matter, is my representatives that would have been Carl Rhodes as well as Romy. Um, he's no longer part of our district, but the rest of the people who represent us, full of shit to me, okay? Um, I've been affected by real property taxes being raised around me, and so I have a lot to say with that. Okay, so I see where you're going with this, but let me have um, more than a minute. Okay, so for those serving individuals and families do not live in the community they serve, house rules, who will enforce the house rules? Will the data be collected? Uh, let me finish first. Okay, so security in the property. Well, what about the surrounding community? We fend for ourselves. Who's going to be responsible for cleaning up the community when these people come through the wake? Because I've had to deal with this for a long time. We didn't see it came into our community, um, came about. Our community was affected by it. The influx of drugs, drug users and dealers ended up in our community because we are not part of the weed and seed community. Um, let me see. Um, that's pretty much what I had to say. And um, being a person who's lived here my entire life, I've seen so much come up around me. Like right now I'm dealing with Matson that's going to be right below where I live. And so I'm ongoing and I'm, I'm, I'm making sure I'm keeping an eye on what's happening down there because it's gonna affect me. The noise pollution, the smell, the parking. I mean, I've seen on Mokoya Street where they brought up a stoplight and I also take um, into consideration Kano trucking and the traffic that they create in the morning. I see on Awiki Street, there's tons of trash and I can just imagine that's gonna turn into a big, big problem. And also for young brothers, they use that road in the morning as a gate going in for all of these big trucks. It's a big problem for me as a resident. And where I live, there's at least 200 to 300 people living on my block. And I'm just one vocal person. I mean, I live and I work at a school. After a long weekend, I have to be part of the team that does the cleanup of needles on my campus, okay, needles. And that's from the drug users from a methadone clinic that's right across the street from a school that I work at, okay? I'm, I'm telling you because I live it and I work within a five mile radius from where I live and I'm very concerned. Thank you very much for your concerns. Uh, I don't have a question, but I do it. I just want to acknowledge a couple of her concerns. Um, and as they relate to the providers, we will continue to work with the providers. If you have some specific areas within the community that need attention and for cleanup, if you could let us know, and we can coordinate with our other city departments and help you address that. Thank you. I don't have a question, but I do have some comment. I live in Chinatown all my life, 60 something years. Right now, Chinatown got a lot of homeless laying on the sidewalk, out in the rain, so forth. At least right now, the city and state get together to help those people put a transition house. I think that's a very good program. I understand you have 24 hour security and a lot of things going on. I think it's a very good program. That's all, thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'm Sandy Shore uh, with the U University of Hawaii School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. We're the next door neighbors to the new facility. Uh, we just got permission from the Board of Land and Natural Resources in January to begin occupying the immediate parcel between the MATC facility and your new facility. What I'm curious about, more than concerned, I guess, there's already quite a number of homeless living out there. It's, they're sleeping under the Kiabi bushes now. They're occupying cars in the parking lot in the, in the boat launch area. They, I presume, are some of them might be part of your facility in the future, some probably not, but I guess there's probably 50 already there. You're talking about another 100. What I'm curious about is the integration of the various groups that will be coming out. You said anybody can get on the bus and come out. And also about the security plans that you have, what specific number of people, fencing, and the general form of that security. Thank you for your question. Uh, so we're going to have Two security guards. One is going to be a roving security guard within the compound, 
The other is going to be in a security guard shack, which is right inside Sand Island Parkway. And that security guard shack is supposed to stop all the vehicles coming into the side road and just ask them what the nature of their visit is. They're not going to prevent anybody from coming in, but at the very least, it'll be a deterrence for people who might want to make trouble out by the boat launch ramp. They'll just ask them, you know, what's your nature of business? Where are you going to go to? If they say they go to the Marine Training Center, fine. We'll let them go. But at the very least, it'll be a deterrence. It won't be a prevention. It'll be a deterrence. So there's going to be a new guard check then that, that restricts access to the whole road? Correct. It, it, it's not going to restrict access. It's you just you do know that there's a locked gate, or a, a gate that can be locked across there, but as far as I know, for we seven years it has not been locked. Yeah, Who's going to have control on that? We're not going to lock the gate. Okay. You're talking the gate to the road to prevent people from coming on the road. That's right. No, no. Okay. It, it's just, it's just going to check people. My name is... Hello, whoa. Yes. my name is Robert Tillander. Um, I'm from Waikiki. Um, my concern and interest is to congratulate your attempts to change strategy, but in a state where we have a one-party government, top to bottom, which permeates, it narrows our options because the people who make decisions are within that fold. What we really are looking at here is a community problem where all people should be involved. The city of Long Beach, California had 35,000 homeless. By developing their program, they reduced it to 2,000. How is this possible? They got everybody who was affected, and that'd be like the Waikiki business community, and I'm a member of the Waikiki Rotary Club. I'm the sergeant of arms. If we started mobilizing the community to say, let's not ship people to a port of delivery on buses, let's have local places where they can go. And the most obvious solution turned out to be churches. Because the people who are chronically homeless do not know where to go. They don't know how to go. And you may put them on a bus to go to some long alphanumeric name for which they don't even know the service. And they may arrive. But what we're really going to need is drivers who will take people in need who knock at the church door and take them to the triage center, which is what I would build on Sand Island. I wouldn't have any residents there. We'll put people in there to find out what their needs are and if they're veterans, what services they're eligible for, and if they're mental health, all those services are currently being paid by current tax budgets. The people just don't get there. If we as a community arose and said, I want to help those people, wouldn't that be interesting? Now you notice that that doesn't fit into city government, that doesn't fit into state government but it does fit into the community. What a concept, that we would actually care. The paper was nice enough to print an article, and the punchline in yesterday's paper was, indifference kills. Thank you. Thank you very much. And triage is probably a very good word. Another word for our assessment, uh, being able to assess folks and decide what is the, the best alternative. Thank you. Hi, Lisa Mitchell. I just want to say um, a lot of things, but <laughs> Housing First is expensive, and I think that's what he was trying to say. And there are so many other alternatives, and I just want to share one idea, turning parking lots into mobile home structures and I remember a time when, before the Japanese um, real estate bubble came, people, Hawaiians, or people, asked for mobile homes. And the state turned it down for whatever reason. So we're not addressing this issue in a, in a better way 
more cost-efficient way. We can do better. It's taxpayer money. We can create better solutions, more cost-effective solutions, more solutions that can serve a broader spectrum of people into the future, not just temporary. And like the gentleman said, it takes all of us to get together and decide that that's a good idea. It's not hard. It's just a matter of allocating the resources differently. That's all it is. And expanding our minds just a little bit more or broader. We're, we're like pigeon and hold this tiny little group with a ton of money. And we could spread those resources around much better, much, much better. Have a few zoning laws changed, just a few, for starters. That's why she says she doesn't trust government, those kinds of things. So many of you here in this room have been here a very long time serving our communities. But we have the same old problems getting worse because we are not looking in a different direction. I'm wondering when the heck, what is it going to take for us to start looking in a different direction? Really. We don't, you know, why are we paying such high taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just for a few people to get someplace? There's millions or at least hundreds of thousands more in need that we could be addressing in a much better way. Thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate it. Um, and just to give you a bit of a comparison, we talk about spending 25000 a year on one individual for housing and wraparound services. The statistics on the homeless folks who visit the emergency room and end up in the hospital, one week of hospitalization is $35,000. So there's, there are other costs. And we're talking about a small portion of the problem. I, I and understand very what population. you are saying. I totally understand what you are saying. I feel like you're not understanding what I'm saying. That's where I get frustrated, personally and whatever, professionally, whatever. We could be doing a lot more with that kind of money. And, and if we had broadened our perspective on things, those people wouldn't need those services. I'll be glad to talk to you this evening or tomorrow, give me a call we can have. We've talked once before, I know. We can continue this conversation. I'd like right to continue this topic where we start getting um, zoning laws changed or looked at. I was at HCDA meeting the other day. Um, I went to that Kakako um, park thing, shared my ideas with the planners there. They said, write it down, write it down, write it down. I wrote it down and I'm not sure it still got heard, and I did talk to Tony Ching, and he said it's a zoning thing. You know, we have rail coming up, we're spending billions on that, but we have thousands of parking structures being built in Kaka'ako, or stalls being built in Kaka'ako. Look at, look at our parking structures. What, what if we had mobile homes in those parking structures, rather than freaking cars that we're supposedly not going to need because we're spending billions on rail. We live on a little tiny island. We're trying to move people from here to there, 20 miles, 20 minutes, but we're spending billions. And then we have parking structures. And I've ridden my bike for years on this island. It's flat. Now it's hot. It's so hot. I'm dying. I'm dying. I don't know about the rest of you. I don't know how you guys do it. Thank you very much. Yes, let's plant trees and yeah. How long has it taken to get a two-way bicycle lane? They're saying, gee, it doesn't really cost that much. 
mad. Really. You know what they said 20 years ago? We don't want to be like some third world country like where they're riding bicycles. Excuse me. We'd like to keep to the I'm just theory. saying. Understand. Understand the frustration. I'm just saying. I understand the frustration. Everything works too slowly for government. I totally understand. It's not even a question well, of slow. We're just, we're, we're, we're like not looking at all. Like, like That's the problem. We we're, we're like blind. Blind. Let's continue this conversation. And I'm sorry I'm frustrated. Thank oh, you. Appreciate I'd love to continue it. The, the I want more than a conversation. Okay. okay, let's do that. It's 21st century. Let's go do it. Do it. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my, my name is John Kiko, and I, re I represent um, SIC, SIR, uh, the Surfers of San Island. <clears throat> and, and, and I'm born and raised in Kali. Never left. <laughs> okay, so my comment is I think you guys should think about it a little bit more because the security stuff is not going to work. Yeah? Because this thing went happy before. You guys didn't drop them in our backyard in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. The, the homeless community came into San Island Park and it never worked because what it was is you guys didn't drop them in our backyard and you guys just left them there. So here comes all the addiction problem come, the crimes come, they start busting out cars for getting to, they want to steal a loose change. Up to a loose change, they want it for steal. Bothering the campers, yeah? So you guys gotta do more homework. And the part about, see, San Island is made out of coral. And coral, when it, when it becomes, um, you run them over a couple of times, it becomes dust. Now the dust, the way you get rid of them is you pour water on them. So you gotta spray water on them. So by putting um, recycled, you know, AC, it's not gonna help because you're gonna have to water the AC too because the AC will become dusty. And then, the problem with that is um, you're gonna have black in them. Any, any dark colors will contract heat. That's why people paint their, their swimming pools dark colors because they don't wanna heat the water, right? And then, um, you know, and if they don't wanna abide by you guys' laws or, or by anybody's laws, they're gonna spill out, spill over. So they're gonna come back in our community, down in our part. They're gonna move in the back of the, um, the San Island Waste Treatment Center. They, they're going to move all in the bushes all over there because they don't want to listen to you guys' law or, or be governed by something. Did you guys do you guys' homework? Did, did you go out into the community in Kaka'ako and, and go see the homeless and see how many people are going to come to this thing? Good question. Did, did you guys do that? We do work with the providers island-wide and we are aware of the numbers of individuals that are in Kaka'ako, yes. Yeah, because they rather really lie down over there on, on top of the street or, or because I, I worked for the city and county <clears throat> for a year and a half and I was working with the homeless in our park. I was a, a groundskeeper and most of them, they, they'll just wait for their, their, their uh, EBT to become active again so they can go out and get their food or some of them even, <clears throat> sorry for speak negative about EBT, but some, some of them they even um, they trade it for 50 cents on a dollar. Like if you give me a hundred dollars, you know, then you can use like $200 off of my EBT card. And that's the kind of thing that goes on, right? So, I mean, this is not the solution. And jumping on me somebody else's backyard is not the solution. I mean, I appreciate you guys thinking about it, but you know, you guys gotta think about it a little bit more. Mahalo. My name is uh, Guy Balgo and I live in downtown. And uh, well, three months ago I made this little model right here. It's full of 40 foot container. Easy to do. The guy in Barber's Point can make them. He's ready for it. You can have a little uh, dining room, lunch area, so that the church can bring every day uh, their meal. We can ban begging. We can, uh, I mean, there is all this, you know, uh, bathroom and all that stuff. So when I see city council 
taking forever to take a, to vote on a bill, to not urinate in the street, to me that's a little bit strange, you know. So you put them in a in a village, I call it a village. They got the door right here, security, paramedic, and, um, and that's it. You get your fans, and you keep track of everybody. I mean, you assess, you um, do a medical uh, triage, find out, make sure they're not, you know, they, and you keep track of them with their pills or whatever they need. And um, that's about it. You put five, ten people in a container, pretty much different partition. Bed is welded, nothing moved. Air mattress, so you can get rid of the bed, uh, the bed bug. Also, it's easy to wash, and uh, and voila. Excellent. So, that's it. Peter is Peter's taking care of our facilities. If you don't mind talking to him after. Okay, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Marlena Rani. Um, I was raised downtown, Queen of my Gardens, uh, very close to Aala Park. I have not been close to Aala Park though, because it scares me. It's dangerous. Um, Santa Island Beach is one of one of the few places that I go to. Um, as far as being a part of the community and the local surfers, the Coast Guard that's out there, I see. Um, I go there quite often. That's not that far from this area. And I do believe this is true. It's gonna spill out. They're not gonna stay in this spot. And uh, it's not just for me, but like I said, there's fishermen, local surfermen, I'm local surfers, Coast Guard, myself. Um, I've seen Groups, I don't know which church, but I've seen local um, churches do baptisms over there. I mean, it is a very, it is used by the local community. So it, I mean, I'm a little, I'm a little shaky because it was very scary to me to think that I wouldn't be able to go there anymore. There's not, there are many places that I can't go anymore. Um, I am all for helping anybody who needs help. I, I care about people very much. That's the people of Hawaii. We do care about each other. But as a member of the community, somebody who pays taxes and, and, and um, cares about other people of the community, this is very disturbing. And, um, you know, beyond, beyond the fact that there's a lot of kids there too, on the weekends, there's parties. And it's all locals. This is one of the few beaches where there's really mostly locals there. So, I'm very concerned, kind of scared, worried that I won't be able to have this space anymore. So, that's just all I have to share. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Sam Mitchell. I'm a member of the Makiki Neighborhood Board and uh, I represent the Thomas Square area where we've had a lot of homeless live and I have no problems with the homeless there. Matter of fact, I help feed them every Sunday food and bombs for many, many years. Um, where I see the problem is, is that you've taken an area that's out in the middle of nowhere and basically say we're going to go over here. Now there's a lot of other areas that could be considered, and I'm going to give you one. It's in my area. Okay. The Honolulu Police Department has a park right next to the police station. Hardly anybody uses it. It's next to the children's um, uh, center, so for the kids. There's a parking facility. There's a um, bus facility right down on the opposite side. Uh, that would be the ideal place because of security. Um, if you're not talking about a lot of people, that's a good area. Now, if you're going to be doing this for more than 100 people, you're going to have to take a look at issues. Now, that container idea is the best idea I've seen all night. 
and I, I think we should work on that. Shipping containers and doing a circle area like that, control the area, is essential. Um, I don't know about the location. I know that there's a lot of problems with soil and uh, contamination with soil with uh, gasoline that used to be used from gas stations. There were a lot of stuff dumped over there. So there's lead contamination from a long time ago when they dug up the area. I think you're going to start finding that when you start doing looks at the, at the soil. I know you are. Um, I, you could pave over the area, you could do all that, but there's so many other areas. What I suggest you do is start talking to the community. Um, we have all kinds of shelters and community services throughout the islands, and the homeless shelters is one of those. So just isolating it out in Santa Ana, I don't think that's a good idea. My name is Tracy Martin. I'm here with my wife Tabitha and my three-year-old daughter Talia. And we're homeless. We live out in Kakaako. Um, I'm up here because I noticed that uh, you guys are scaring the citizens and the homeless families with these chronically homeless. The spill out I heard, that's the craziest. You know, not the families. We don't want to be homeless. But we are, you know. A lot of us ran into bad times. A lot of the families out there are out there because of credit, you know. If you just drive through Kapapo, it's easy to say, ew, you know, because you see tents, tarps, rubbish, you know. We try to clean up. Next time you drive through, stop. You try to talk to people, you know. Even the kids. That's the only thing you guys should be looking after the kids. You know? A lot of adults, they need some guidance also, but hey, you know, stop working on the children because they're growing up like this. You know? And um, a lot of people, a lot of families, they don't want to be in a controlled environment. A lot of men especially, they lost their dignity already. You know, Yes, we need to do what we can to get back off the street. A lot of us are. Um, my family will be off the street soon, maybe another six months. Um, but every time you guys do a sweep and take some of our stuff, it sets us back. We don't want to be there. And we're just you know, asking for a little help. You know, you guys are cramming this down our throat. Let us stay where we are, you know, we'll get out. We'll get on our feet, we'll get out, you know. There's a lot of families out there that want to do that. You know? so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question. Can I ask a, can I ask a question? Hi, my name is uh, H. Doug Matsuoka. I'm with Hawaii Gorilla Video Hui, which explains this thing. Um, earlier today at the Council, uh, Bill 42 was passed, the sit and lie bill. Uh, part of it on the representation by the uh, managing director, that, or at least the suggestion that this uh, facility would house the people that were not currently on the sidewalk uh, on Waikiki. So my question is, what is your projection of the number of people on the sidewalk in Waikiki that will come here instead of stay on the street in Waikiki? Thank you. Uh, we understand from the Waikiki community that there's probably at least 50 and possibly up as much as 100 people on the streets of Waikiki. You know, it's a voluntary program, and it's a program that segues into permanent housing, permanent supportive housing. I can't speculate as to how many people will come in off of the Waikiki streets. Well, it was a justification helpful. for passing Bill 42, out, so... You've heard how everyone many? who's homeless here, and they have, people have needs and interests 
This may not be something for everyone. We're hoping that people who want to get into permanent supportive housing would use this as a transition. And so that's what we're, what we're offering. Um, but we can't force people. We're not taking people off the side. Well, look, it's not for the, pe the families in Kaka'ako. They don't fit the profile. They're not coming here. How many of the people on the sidewalk in Waikiki do you project will come here? Our goal is to get at least 40 people off the streets in Waikiki. That's our goal. Yeah, that's your projection. That's 40. our goal. Well, it's not a projection, it's what our is goal. It? Semantics. Okay, thanks. You answered the question. Hi, my name is Jody Endicott. I'm an artist. I, I see things ahead of time. I love your container idea. I love your site idea. I think that container idea. That wall should be filled just with locker spaces for people who are homeless to be able to keep their things. One of the, you know, one of the reasons people are afraid of going to Waikiki or some of the letters in the, new, in the newspaper have to do with all these belongings. We'll give them a place to put their belongings and put that on wheels. Put your triage center on wheels rather than, you know, I'm from Kailua. We have homeless there. Bring your triage people over to Kailua and do give them all those wonderful services that you can offer them, but put it in a truck and wheel it over there and wheel it to each community and deal with this problem and use your Sand Island one place as a place just to house their things, not the people. And these shipping containers we can, we can use very effectively. There's other things that we can do, even cardboard boxes that can be built into shelters that have been done in Japan. One of the other things, this, this bill about trying to control someone's bladder by a bill and then making them a criminal, that doesn't work. What needs to happen is what San Francisco did. Again, a truck on wheels, bathrooms on wheels. You wheel them to the people, you let them take a shower, you let them go try and find a job, and you, they trust you after a while, and then they'll want to go to something like your housing first. That's Great all idea. I have to say. Thank you. Good idea. Thank you. I was in San Francisco a few weeks ago, and I did look at what they're doing over there for bathroom facilities. And this is Lava May. This is a bus with a hygiene center on it. It's a fabulous idea really fabulous idea. We're looking at it. We're trying to figure out how we can do it. But this is the most fabulous part about Lava May. They did it totally without public funding. <laughs> totally without public funding. I wanted to say one more thing. He's going to build you a container village. I'm an artist. I can get architects together. Let's challenge the architects. Challenge that would the be artists. fabulous. Let's be creative come up with solutions and wheel all those solutions in front of City Hall, put them on all the parking lots and look at what we can do. I appreciate that's a great that. Idea. I think that's a great idea. I just want to finish this thing with Lava May. They, they raised $150,000 for this bus and retrofitting it was over $75,000 and they did it by crowdsourcing. Incredible idea of social media, crowdsourcing. And it costs them three hundred thousand dollars a year to operate, and um, and they have two volunteers and two paid staff that run it. They provide four days of services, shower facilities that is mobile. They go from place to place, um, and it's. I mean, people come out there. I stood there, and people come out of there after taking a shower. They smell really good. They smell really good, and uh, and they were happy. They were really happy. We need more happy. So it's something that we're working on. It is a great idea. But as someone else suggested, it takes a community. It takes all of us to work on ideas like this. Yeah, my name is Larry Geller. Speaking of community, I very much like the idea of the truck. In other words, you fill the truck with uh, social service workers, maybe RNs and different kinds of services and you bring it to the community where you need, we have people who need the help, and you make a match, and you, you do that. But that's not what this project is about. 
This project is not about helping homeless people on the street. If you look at the RFP that the city issued for the main project, not for this part, uh, I'm not sure it's out yet, uh, perhaps it is, but I haven't seen it. The main RFP for what they're calling Housing First, the first objective in that RFP is to move people out off of the street. In other words, they're a pest, they're an eyesore, the city doesn't want them in Kaka'ako because you can't rent out these buildings to uh, you know, expensive mainland, uh, not rent, you can't sell these condos to expensive mainland people if there are people on the street that they don't want to see. We need to get down to brass tacks. If we as a community want to help people who are forced to live on the street by city ordinances That's right. that took them out of the parks and put them on the edge of the sidewalk, if we want to help those people, we can do it. Okay? If we're interested in instead cleaning up and sweeping and taking people's possessions and their cholesterol bags and their medicine and their ID, as they have said, has, uh, has occurred over and over again. Nothing the city is doing at this point is helping those people. The state, by the way, cut the mental health services that were assisting people in staying in their housing, in their existing housing. As a result of that, it's documented in sworn testimony to the legislature that people died as a result of having the mental health services cut. We don't have any numbers, but it's, I think it's indisputable that when those services were cut, which was around 2007 through 2010, that people ended up out of the house and in the street. So we have a community here. It's quite a different gathering from the people who are at the legislature today. If the community wants to assist people, um, we know how to do this. The Evidence First programs, Housing First, is cheaper than what's being planned. Honolulu, this is 2014, we are not in the vanguard of Housing First. Other places have been doing this since like 2004, reporting on their success in 2006. We are 10 years behind at least, and that's why we're having to spend the money. But let's spend it, people, on our community. Let's spend it on helping people, not with an objective of cleaning the streets of Waikiki, of, of people that nobody wants to look at. It will work out that way anyway. If people can be helped, then they will leave the streets and move into permanent housing. So the money that we spend, that we want our government, whether it's the state level or the city level, to spend should be to put people into housing first and provide the wraparound services to them in the housing, which is quite different from the services that are provided to people on the streets. Thank you. Thank you. How's it everybody? My name is Al. Um, hey, Al. First thing first, the location, bad. Very bad location. I don't know where you guys got the place to put somebody over there when there's no public transportation access, nothing. When you guys have other places like Kalelo, where you used to have huge challenge, shut down, empty, bedrooms. You know what I mean? I've been homeless, been prison, been new challenge, been programs. And right there, what you doing with your little project? Look like on prison. Look like on camp. No lie. And you don't want to be forced, you know what I mean, to do anything. But, you know, I've been through all that. You don't want to be told what to do because you guarantee you're going to fight against the system. That's just the way it is. That's the struggle. You know, you're not going to be forced fit. It's like E, 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 but you shed and, you know, vomit. Same thing. That's the way of life. But this is good on public here because I really hope it's going to be like how the marina, you guys are trying to build a level, trying to build the marina in San Island because the people can stop it. You know, mainly for our kiki, the future. San Island is an heritage of people from sure. way long ago, from Mokaya Island to the islands, you know what I mean, to the whole little area. It's a fishing village back in the Hawaiian days. And that right there will stop everybody from coming. Simple as that, you know. And you guys gonna be just leaving them there. What's gonna happen, they're gonna be going to the streets, they're going to these multi-million dollar businesses, they're gonna be robbing them, taking their kappa, taking whatever they can. Because that's just the way of a criminal mind. Not seeing everybody homeless is criminal. Because the majority of them is families in the struggle because everything is too high in Hawaii. Okay. You know what I mean? You get taxed. Hawaii Electric Company, all they tell us we turn off for electric, St. Paul, 529. That's bullshit. You know what I mean? If they did different ways, bro, we would have better resources and better Hawaii. You know what I mean? So we can live sustainable. And that's all I got to say. Like, you know, if you guys going to put something together, you know, get the knowledge first. You know what I mean? Go out to the people. Instead of this kind of public meeting, go out, talk to the people who's there daily. The Kalu Palace. 
the people, you know what I mean, that surfing, the people who's fishing, the people who take care of the dirt bike track. You know, it's it's a small community. Kali as a whole entirety is a big hop, you know? And we just gotta work together before you guys start just making you guys wait, because you guys forcing them. They're kinda like mafia kind of stuff, these booting people <laughs> around, you know? And we don't like that as people. Mahalos, thank you guys a lot. Mahalo. Somebody bought a four-story building, and they, it's right down uh, San Pedro and Sixth San Pedro, and it's only for homeless. They have volunteers that run it. Uh, they get the uh, homeless cleaned up, very cut in shape or whatever, and they actually train them. They train them in a job so that they can go out and work and be respected. Uh, mind you, it might be a, a guard duty someplace, uh, watching trucks or whatnot, but at least they get a, a job and get working. And they have other vocational s skills. If you look into the midnight vision, I think we could do the same thing. I've se I'm in real estate. I've seen warehouses that are large and not being used. Now, this, uh, the Midnight Mission was a four-story warehouse downtown that wasn't being used, and there is a lot of philanthropic groups that are willing to give food. I think they feed about 15,000 a night, and they have housing where they can sleep, take showers, and after a while they can have their own place up on the fourth floor, which is sort of the target. But it's different from what you are planning to do, and this could be uh, something that maybe each one of the communities could have. Something to look into. I, I think a lot of you guys are internet ease. Look up the Midnight Mission and see what they provide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to come on? Hello, Glenn. Can I speak up right here? Please. please. I normally go the last person. But from hearing everything today, I find out that you folks have been asleep for 53 years. Why I say that is because down 96792, we have five homeless shelters. In Kailailoa, there's three homeless shelters. And they're still homeless on the beaches. Still homeless going all the way to Waikiki. So when the city will step up and do this, hey, get in them off the street. My concerns with the children, what happens to the children if they have to live on the street? And that's what for 53 years I fought against. Bring them into shelters. How can they take them off the road when they run away from the, the outreach workers? The outreach workers gotta go look. You know how many can? You know how many homeless out there? Ask the policemen. They know how many out there. So what they're doing now, the city is stepping up so that we can put them there and then the outreach workers can question them and talk to them and put them into shelters. Yes, we need more than five shelters in Waianae and three in Kailua. We need some in Kailua, Waimanalo, and wherever you come from, or even in Puuhale. I was born here. Yeah, rather I was born in Chinatown when Dr. Steve, uh, did Dr. Steve home calls. Yeah, I was raised in 724. Puuhali Road. Were there, were there any homeless then? No, there wasn't. There wasn't the homeless. It wasn't until after the war. After the war came, 
the secular wall, Korean wall, all those walls, and we ran across a lot of them were military men who, were, who suffered from what they call shell shock. Yes, a lot of them suffered from them, and all they needed was to be have a talk to, but uh, nobody stepped forward. Because we had a business, my husband took them off the beach in Wai'anae. We had plenty down there. Yes, plenty. He hired them. Then we found out that they moved to uh, Sand Island. So he used to go there and pick up workers from there. And that's how I knew about Sand Island. That's how I, we dropped everything off. Clothing, food, whatever we could give them, we, we gave to them. Now, we cannot go on the street and stop by and give. At least, we can give over here. <coughs> so I thank the city for stepping forward to helping the homeless. We won't have homeless, but there were a lot of people that were terrorized on the mainland when their houses were, were taken away by flood or whatever. And let me tell you, a lot of them moved here. One way, one way. The military guys would send one way ticket here and pocket change in the, bo in, in the pocket. After they lose their power. And even the families collected the insurance money. You could check on a big island. You know the Puna where all those, where all those damages was going on? They bought there. Now they're suffering again. Yeah? That's not fair. We have to aloha people. This is the aloha state. And by shutting them down, it's no way aloha. Thank you. appreciate everything she just said, um, specifically, we are the Aloha State, we're the heart chakra of the planet, I've said that before, and I wish we really get that, and regarding military housing and military, but military housing, we have an opportunity to support the downsizing of the army, which would open up Schofield, Wheeler, and Fort Shafter bases. So ideally, if our government could support that, even with this crazy war that's being declared, you know, that would be a really good thing. That's thousands of housing units opened up right there. And a new economy. Excuse me. I, I know that some people are leaving. We want to make sure that we, we, were able, we were able to contact you if you have any information, or if you have more information, or if you have any questions. I um, just want to make sure that you know that uh, we set up an information line for the city um, at 723-7233. Please feel free to call this number um, if you have any questions. We're also setting up an email um, account for this as well. And we'll get that information out to the community as well. Sorry, I just wanted to get that out before people left. My apologies for cutting you off. I know I do talk about kind of out there stuff, um, so it's kind of maybe hard to absorb for a lot of people, and the momentum for this kind of thinking and doing is not really there yet. And I just talk because hopefully, somehow, some way, planting a seed of that. And it's called the art of allowing, where we allow each other to make choices that are different from, let's say, the status quo. So it's like, if you don't march to the beat of the drum of go, 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 get, 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 now we're out of basic housing. And I guess that's my real bitch, <laughs> excuse me, is we're not addressing that. We're not addressing the basic real housing issue is that it's not affordable. How much longer are we going to live like that? So, yeah, I would just 
you know, I would like to see some real change, some real um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa always has such good ideas. Um, some of some of the things that she addressed are really important. Um, she was talking about mobile homes. Uh, boxer housing, the Democratic Party has a platform that we, the by union, the machinist union, passed about steel clearing homes, and water catchment systems that are off the grid, and uh, basically from the Big Island, or when they have lava flows, they move things. They're not looking at these issues. We put it through the, um, the Senate, and it passed with like 70% when it got to the house, they got killed in the committees. But that's not the issue that we need to talk about right now, even though it, is, it affects more people. We're talking about homeless issues. Now, one of the things that you really haven't touched on is where are these guys going to get? You know, we, we talked a little bit about containers over there, using it. Um, and there was discussion about tents, and they wanted people to get their own tents and things like that. And that's really hard because every time they get a tent, it gets taken by the city. So the question is, will you be opening up your tent supply that you have that you haven't been able to, people haven't <laughs> to give to people so they have places? Um, that's one question. And I'm giving you a suggestion. Um, glad trash bags makes a tent for concerts that are a combination garbage bag tent that's supposed to be used for outdoor concert for two or three days. And you take it and you just dispose all your garbage in it after two or three days. And they're giving them away free. If the city could get in touch with GLAD and say, hey, we want to use this as a way for people that can't go in the shelter because they have a pet or something, and then they can get an accurate number on exactly how many people are in the shelter that are trying to use the shelter because you'll know by that certain type of tent and you can keep a number of them and they can clean up after themselves because they have a garbage bag that they can number and they can whatever so they can keep track of who's coming where and who's living here. So that's something you can start on. Great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, good meeting. Um, question for the administration is this. Uh, is this Sand Island project a done deal or is the administration still open to other ideas, some of them which have been expressed this evening? Not a done deal. Very, very early in the process. As we said, we don't even know if we can get the land from DLNR yet. Um, we're looking at, at, at our Friday hearing to understand that. We still haven't moved forward on all of our due diligence yet. So throughout that process, we'll be, we'll be making determinations moving forward. So definitely not a done deal. It's a proposition at this time. <coughs> well, Jessica, we have to be out of here by 7.45. We're going to um, So we'd like to, oh, Representative Patola. My name is Romy Cachola. I wasn't about to uh, speak, but being the representative of the district, I just want something clarified, okay? Because people will be asking me a lot of questions. Now, assuming that the land board says, okay, you can use it, will you continue building this shelter in spite of the very negative more or less testimony coming from different people. If the land board gives us the right of entry and, and approves the lease, yeah. we'll move forward on the due diligence. Now the due diligence is not just for the site itself, but it's also for the community touches to make sure that we work with the community further. We work with the homeless community and the service provider community to run. So that's that's the commitment we have moving forward. Yeah, but I heard that 
you folks will be working and fast tracking it for the uh, next two months. See, if there is approval, for example, for the land board, will there be already a commitment that this project is a done deal? There's a commitment to move forward on the due diligence. There's, nobody said there was a fast track. We, when Mr. Shirai had indicated what the timing is, we're looking at about three months. Okay. That's the general timing. There are a lot of places that can possibly house the homeless or the shelter and their first housing. Housing first. Why is Sun Island selected? What are the more or less features of Sun Island that more or less is now being used by the city as well as maybe the state administration? Why Sun Island, not others? Yeah, I guess we had looked at about 25 other sites and there's I mean, there's no objective criteria we looked at, but we did look at sites and the good and bad of all the sites. Um, we, we definitely didn't want to try Olive Park because it was too close to urban centers. Sand Island was picked because it was relatively not abutting an urban center, essentially. It's also a site that we could get from a lease from the state. We looked at city land, we looked at about 20, 20-something different uh, city parks, city lands, anywhere where we thought we could put that. Is that all? What you mean, is that all? If that's all your explanation? Yeah. Okay. When you're coming up with spending so much money to put all the infrastructure, water, what else? Uh, security? transportation, and you'll be spending all that as well as all the different uh, providers. Okay. You will be spending it upfront before you can transfer or move the homeless to Sun Island. Is that correct? Partially. No, not partially because you have to No, partially them. because we're going to ramp up the program. So it's not like we have to put in Ten bathrooms for everybody. If we have a dozen people, we'll put in several bathrooms. We get a dozen more, we can put in another several bathrooms. So it is a ramping up process where we can gradually spend the money. We don't have to put it all in front. Okay. On transportation, will it be 24 hours? No. So that means if it's not 24 hours, there will be curfew as to when they should be coming back or getting out. There's no, curf there's no curfew. Yeah, but what if they want to come back? So we'll be telling them we'll be closing the facility at a certain time. No, we're not closing the facility. So no rules. There's going to be rules. So I, I think uh, Director, when you open, always already covered that. I just want to be clarified because if it's not a 24-hour service of transportation and they're out, okay, so we'll be telling them we will be closing the facility. No, we're not closing well. the facility. Okay, the transportation is not available to you. Right, right. but they can freely time. walk out, they can walk back. Correct. Representative Kuchel, right now we cannot really speak to how much transportation we're going to have. We're still going through the RFQ process. We still have to talk to the service providers to see what they can provide. So, to your point, um, we don't know if it's going to be 24 hours. We don't know how much yet, but we have to go through that process to speak to the service providers to understand how much we can offer. Lastly, before spending so much money to put up the facility, infrastructure, and all that, have you done your homework and trying to at least assess the homeless whether they want to move or not? Good question. Right now, we've, we've looked at a, we looked at sites that we could use. We're still going to go through the due diligence process with the homeless community and with the service provider. So what, for example, the homeless just don't want to go there and you already spent the money? That's, that's, you know, that's the, right, right now what we're looking at is putting out a site that's an availability. It's an alternative to what's available right now. Something that we think that can work, can feed into the program, the Housing First program that we have going forward. Yeah. That is a risk that they might not want to come. Yeah, but you're already spending. You've got to do your homework and try to get the homeless some the idea they want to come. I totally before agree. Spending. Which is why we're going to do our due diligence moving forward before we set up the site. 
So this will be the last information on him in their area. Well, there's going to be many more touches with the community. So you're going to go to Kalihi because they will be affected too. So I just want to know this because as a representative of the district, when people ask me, I know what to answer. Of course. And I really respect that. For us, uh, to answer your question, there's going to be many more touches with the community, and we'll have at least one more uh, informational meeting. One more? At least one more. Lastly, by asking this question, I should not be cons uh, construed as against the homeless. I was telling uh, Pam about my experience. My heart is for the homeless, but they should be treated with respect. Because I, for one, and my family were almost homeless when we were here. And that's why I want to make sure that the homeless is treated properly. Not just come up with a shelter and then no facilities available for them. Because now, I don't believe that there will be no rules about or a curfew for them to come back. There will be. Because you only have two securities. Will the security be 24 hours too? Yes. Security, so. and, case security and, and facility management will be 24 steps. Okay. And the businesses, you got to get in touch with them because they will be spending a lot of money on security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate your input. Um, we want to make sure that everybody understands this is not the end of our touches with the community. We want to make sure that everybody understands that we welcome the input from the communities. We always make sure it always makes the projects better or the initiatives better when we can touch bases with the community. So please feel free to call the number. We'll make sure we get more information out to your representatives and your senators on how, how better to, to contact the city. If you want to send emails, we'll send out, um, make sure that we have to set up an email address for this. Um, if you want to call and get information in, please do. Um, Again, the ideas that come off in the communities are, are absolutely great. And we want to make sure that we take them into the project, take them into the initiative, so we can make things better for everybody here. As um, Managing Director Shin had, had indicated, and many people have indicated tonight, um, it does take a community to make this work. But we really, we really want to make sure we work with them. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great night. Okay, we've been live uh, from Puuhale Elementary School. This is a uh, public hearing, informational hearing with question and answers on the uh, housing first, what they're calling a housing first transitional uh, shelter. It was used to justify the passage of Bill 42 today that would cover uh, Waikiki, that would uh, criminalize uh, sitting down or lying down on the um, sidewalk, a uh, somewhat controversial bill. Third hearing, third and final hearing on that was today, where um, representations from Member Shin, the managing director of the city of Honolulu, uh, brought up this facility um, as being the alternative for the homeless people uh, lying and sitting on the sidewalk uh, in Waikiki. Um, so this uh, plan was very rushed, and that kind of shows. Um, my, that's my own editorial you know, commentary. I'm totally against the sit and lie bills, totally against the criminalization of the homeless, uh, and think that uh, this poor person's prison is completely ill-advised and what we should be working on is affordable housing uh, and not uh, the housing for billionaires that we have going up in Kaka'ako where condos will start at the Vaiea will start at one and a half million go up to over thirty million dollars So I'm going to cut away. We had a lot of good uh, question and answers, especially. We see uh, city administration, uh, Jun Yang in the back, director of uh, housing. I call him director of de-housing because he helps lead the raids on the houses and has de-housed more people than he has housed. Uh, 
uh, we had the media cover it in this corner. It's a uh, reporter from the uh, AP Associated Press. Uh, center screen is uh, Jesse Broder Van Dyke, who is like the, uh, I don't know what, what do we call him, the representative of, uh, of uh, Mayor. Uh, I see Bob Nakata. Legislator Jordan, is she a representative or senator? Uh, a lot of opinion makers from the community. There's uh, Carl Rose, uh, Larry Geller in the back, Chris Nova Smith, Sam Mitchell here coming up, the Geeky Neighborhood Board, and Machine is in. And hey! And we're going to cut away now and get ourselves back home. I'm going to download this and try and get it up on YouTube. Uh, earlier, of course, there was a big crowd. Everyone's uh, gone uh, at the moment. So I'm going to take off, too. Thanks for joining us live from Pu'uhale Elementary School. This has been the informational public hearing on the Sand Island poor person's prison that was used to justify the passage of Bill 42.